It's my pleasure to welcome Emily Sander to the podcast today. Emily is an, a C-suite executive turned leadership coach, and her company, as she's the founder of, is Next Level Coaching. She has written two books. She's uh, written Hacking Executive Leadership, and she wrote An Insider's Perspective on the Chief of Staff, Why You Need One and How to Be a Great One. And we end up talking a good amount about the chief of staff position and then get into a little bit of sort of the coaching part of, of supporting a, an organization. And we get into a lot of stuff about uh, that's related to what we do here in the eye of power as it relates to what's true and in, on our individual level. And uh, it's my great, great pleasure to welcome Emily. Welcome to the Eye of Power podcast. I'm your host, Tom Dardick. But this podcast is not about me. It's about you and your power. It's time to claim yours. So Emily, I I just want to Thank you, number one, for being with me today. And I'm really excited to learn from you the perspective of from of somebody who's a, used to be a chief of staff, and now you're a consultant, a coach, and to help people from what a chief of staff pers- uh, perspective is. And I'm just wondering, you know, what's unique about that particular framework as it relates to organizational success? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on your show. And a chief of staff is a unique role and no one else in the company has the perspective or the vantage point of a chief of staff, including the CEO. And so what I mean by that is the chief of staff, instead of being assigned to one functional area like operations or finance or product, they see across the entire organization. So if you think about vertical silos, they actually see horizontally across all those all those departments and they can connect dots and they can see where things are working well holistically as a business. And they can also see where, oh, whenever it gets here, it gets stuck or there's not quite a clean handoff from this team to that team in this in this stage. So they're seeing the whole board to kind of use a chess analogy. So that's that's one thing that's unique about the the chief of staff role. There's much more to say about that role, but I'll pause there just for a second. <laughs> sure. So you um what I'm take from that then Emily is that you get a good sort of view of the organizational architecture, what's working, what's not working, uh, and therefore be in a position to what make help advise to make ju- uh, adjustments where necessary, whether it be structural or personnel wise, is, is that what I'm getting? Yes, yeah, so I think organizational architecture is a great way to think about it. It's, it's, it's they're in charge of the underlying system of business. So that's again, the, those cross func- functional pieces. Um, and it also is personnel. So they're the chief of staff. And so they primarily work with their principal, which can be the CEO or another executive. They work very closely with the executive leadership team, but ultimately they're in charge of the entire staff. And whether that's individually, you get to know everyone at a small company, or if that's let me provide the structure and processes and the tools and opportunities for people to be doing their best work and to have the information they need to progress and learn and grow, then there's that aspect of of being a chief of staff as well. But I think there certainly is you know, in terms of strategy, so I work with a lot of chief of staff clients now, it's it's January, so it's the beginning of the year, a lot of people are putting their strategy in place, and the chief of staff is spearheading that. So with input and collaboration with the CEO and executive team, but the chief of staff is executing to a lot of those plans and a lot of those pieces. So is that how it's distinct from, say, head of HR? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's overlaps, right? So I often get the question, you know, head of HR, um, head of operations, you know, these two things kind of seem the same in a lot of places. And I would say they certainly work together. And a chief of staff can certainly be involved in certain HR activities or helping out with certain operations 
programs, but their job is not to know the most about operations in the corp in the organization. Their job is not to be focusing and running all things operations. They should have a working knowledge of that and then put those pieces together uh, across the board. So I think it is very much, I always say they don't have a attachment to their functional area like other leaders do. And so therefore they have the freedom to say, I am not biased towards operations. I'm not mm -hmm. biased to finance. I am biased to what's best for the business. So whatever yes. is best for the business overall and the leadership team overall, that's what I'm going to be advocating for. It's funny when I go in and talk to people uh, in organizations about people strategy, one of the things I ask in one form or another, I'll say, you know, all right, who's the boss around here? Who's who, <laughs> who are we serving? And and there is a right answer to that, right? The, the right answer is the organization because without that, nobody has anything. Clients have nothing, you know, so, so, and it's, and when people are doing harm to the organization, they're generally not doing it because they want to harm the organization, right? They're doing it, they're doing it out of ignorance or out of, they don't know what they're doing is actually causing harm yeah. or that they think that harm is, has a, has a positive component that, that countermands it or something. What right. Do you think I think, about that? Yeah, I think another uh, another key piece of chief of staff is it's highly adaptable. Ah. So meaning so meaning you can have you have hundreds and thousands of different versions or iteration of the chief of staff role. So it depends on like company size, company stage, the makeup of a leadership team, what's going on in that industry, what's highest priority for the company. So a lot of times the chief of staff will gap fill and especially at smaller organizations they'll gap fill pretty meaty roles they'll gap fill like oh i'm the chief of staff and coo i'm the chief of staff and head of hr and so those are those are big pieces they take on and it's adaptable in the sense that what a chief of staff does so what a chief of staff does at company a and company b can be very different but you could be a good chief of staff at both companies. And then if you take a chief of staff at company A at six months to six years, they're also gonna be doing very different things. So it's kind of a, a function of time and also a function of the, the company you're working in. So it's very adaptable, it evolves, it's, it's very fluid. It's, uh, it's really influential. If you set that role up right as an organization, it can game change your whole team and your whole organization. What I'm getting from that, Emily, is that um, it can really help more elegantly manage stages of growth because you start to get into these problems, right? That as, as you as you get to places, new emergent needs come up. We don't have the resources to directly address those needs. People get spread thin. Stresses go high. Oops, we got to hire. Who? Oh, well, you should hire this. Well, you should hire that. And what I'm hearing there is that ad ad adaptability and the ability to fill gaps help smooth that process out so that we can more elegantly and not run into those ceilings that tend to happen as, as organizations grow. Is, am I catching you right there? Yeah, that, that is right. And I, I would also say that a chief of staff helps the team know, okay, what are we trying to do here? So everyone kind of gets heads down and they can get tunnel vision and just kind of do what's right in front of them. Mm. But as an organization, and especially as a leadership team, you got to pick your head up and look forward and say, where are we trying to go? What are we trying to achieve? And then reverse engineer and back into that. And a chief of staff can again, keep that big picture in mind because they're not sucked down into the day to day. Now, a chief of staff will absolutely go back and forth between strategic and tactical, but I think a chief of staff can help facilitate conversations and reminders for the leadership team about here's our top three priorities. Yes, you have 47 things that you could legitimately doing, but here's our top three and which one of those best connect to those. And, and even amongst those, it might be, okay, well, you know, 20 of them connect to our big three, Emily. And in that case, it's which one optimizes your contribution more. So where do you get the most bang for your buck? If you do this activity and work on this project, how close are you getting to the big three goals? If you do that opportunity and that activity, how close are you getting to the big three goals? Oh, that one's more, that one's further, that one's closer. So I go do that one. Wow, this sounds like a job I really love. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's fun. It's that really was awesome. Fun. 
So, yeah. so that brings me to um, what brought you along your path, Emily, how you got to be a chief of staff, and now you're a, um, a, an executive leadership coach that is helping chiefs of staff, right? So, so you've sort of developed along these lines. Tell us a little bit about your journey that brought you along these lines, if you don't mind. Yes. So I was, so I'll make a long story short. So I worked with my CEO at a previous job. So we were at a 15 years ago now, um, but we were at this company that was private equity backed. And then fast forward a whole bunch of years later, the private equity company invested in another uh, organization and they wanted to bring known players back into the org. So they hired the CEO and then they pinged me and said, Hey, do you guys want to get the band back together and smoke jump into this investment? And we said, yes. And I actually came in not as chief of staff, but I came in as, uh, I think it was VP of strategic initiatives. Okay. So kind of like this catch all kind of amorphous, this title can be whatever the CEO needs it to be. And I was doing chief of staff like things under that title and in that role. And then as things developed, it made sense and it kind of just became clear, oh, she's fulfilling a chief of staff role. Let's make that official to open up more. But um, I had the, the advantage of knowing my principal, my CEO before, which some chiefs of staff don't. And that's, pretty, that's a pretty difficult task to go in there. And certainly not impossible, but it makes it even more challenging. So I knew my CEO before, and I also knew our PE investors on the board. And so that that made it very familiar and uh, kind of help help me glide into the chief of staff role. And so and are you still doing a chief of staff role full time then? I'm not. So I'm a former oh, okay. chief of staff. And then, uh, yes, to, to your second part of your original question, a few years ago, I said, OK, let me look back on all of my corporate jobs and say, what was what was my favorite? Like, what were my favorite parts of each job? And it was the mentoring aspects and mm. the advice and guidance and individual one on one where like, oh, like I got to help Jennifer get promoted or oh my gosh, like Christian, you know, now can present at our workshop for 200 people and he was terrified of speaking in public. So those types of things just uh, just I was drawn to they were memorable. I was rewarded uh, by those things. And so I said, well, if, if that's my favorite part of the day, wouldn't it be nice if I could wake up and do nothing but my favorite part of the day all day long? So once I kind of figured that piece out and put it together with coaching, I, I you know went all in on my coaching practice. And it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure and a fun, challenging ride. And um, because I was in the chief of staff role and I have the coach training, a lot of chiefs of staff reached out to me for 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 coaching. And I said, absolutely. So that's kind of how that came about. So you leaned into that, that became a bit of a brand for you then? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I love the chief of staff role. I mean, you said like, I think I'll like that role. I loved being a chief of staff. It was so fun. It was never boring. It was challenging in all the good ways. And I felt like I could wake up and make an impact on our organization. So I actually wrote a book about chief of staff um, and I speak on panels about chief of staff just because I think more and more people and organizations need to know about this role and also how to use it right. So that's what's, that's definitely what, a passion. What's the book's name? It's called An Insider's Perspective on the Chief of Staff. Okay, awesome. I saw it on Amazon and Kindle and all the places you get books. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And what you were saying earlier, I was smiling because it, it, it's those moments of breakthrough that really, it doesn't take many of them before you you just feel so fulfilled helping people like that. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And that's what, that's, what's so nice about being in the, the, you know, people call it self-help or development. I, you know, whatever term you want to use I mean, to me, it's just, unblocking the things that hold us in place and get more of our agency, more of our, our, you know, our authentic self, bring that to the world and get out of our own ways and let our, you know, spread our wings and let us fly. And the things that tend to hold us back are those self-imposed beliefs and limits that somehow they, they might've worked at some point in our path in the path in the past, but they no longer serve. And we sometimes lose sight of that, that they're, they're holding us back and not serving us, right? Well, I certainly think that, you know, I was very goal oriented. I was very career driven since I was just little. That's kind of how I was built. But there did come a point, like very similar to what you just described, where it's like, hey, 
I'm hustling, I'm doing well, I'm getting ahead, I'm exceeding, but at what? Is this actually what I want to be pointing yeah. all of my energy and time toward? And while it was close and while I really enjoyed my career and am grateful for it, I said, hmm, okay, let me be intentional about going over in this coach direction where I can be more of an influence and more of an impact um, in the way that I want. So, and I, you know, just zooming out, I my worldview is I believe that when everyone is operating at the top of their potential and what they're supposed to be doing, the world is a better place. Yeah. Um, so I'm certainly in my element in coaching. I love it. That's just kind of how I'm built and what I meant to do. And when people, when my clients are successful or when they break through a mental block where it's like, Emily, I couldn't do that before. I, I didn't think I could do that. And now they can. Oh my gosh. Like I just, I just get a dopamine rush from, from all <laughs> that stuff. So um, I think it is worth, I think it is worth asking kind of what am I going after? And like, yep, that still makes sense. That's still what I, I want to do. Or hmm, like I still want this part of that, but this part has actually changed. So let me adjust and be intentional about where I'm going. You probably find like I do that most people aren't that far, right? Like you, like you kind of said through your story, you know, it was a slight adjustment going from the chief of staff to the coaching piece was very intersection and and it was just a slight adjustment, but sometimes slight adjustments can make all the difference, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a, oh, this is a great book called The Compound Effect. And they say, hey, if a plane's going from Seattle to New York and it's like one degree off, will it still oh, get yeah. to New York? It's like, no, it ends up in like, you know, Virginia or Florida <laughs> or something crazy exactly. like that. So little adjustments can can be a big impact. I think for me, I knew it was the right move. I knew it's what I wanted to do, but it was still scary because I had never done it before. And it was scary because I'm very comfortable in the corporate world. I know exactly how things go. I can make teams. I can talk to boards. I can manage executives and all these all these different things. But you go, Emily, run a coaching business, run your coaching practice. Ah, uh, OK, <laughs> let me learn how to do that. <laughs> um, and it's had to put the pieces together. But uh, there were definitely scary moments where I was like, what the heck did I get myself into? But then. <laughs> Then I figured it out and put one foot in front of the other. I'm smiling because uh, you can't probably see on my model here, but uh, what you're talking about is both uh, the side of the equation of the model, which is on the on the self-directed action versus attitude. And you talked about, so you had the honesty with yourself to be and the congruency and to be able to see what's true about yourself, but then the courage to actually take that action, go through, you know, courage is sometimes people have a little bit of a different view of what courage, oh, she's brave meaning that she she's not afraid to do something it's like no that's not what what courage is courage is being afraid and doing it anyway yes. so i i i want to honor you for for your courage to to step out into that way because that's where you found freedom satisfaction joy purpose Right. Yeah, thank yeah, thank you for that acknowledgement. And I think that a lot of people get stuck there, you know. It's like I kind of I want to do this. I know I want to do this, but the inertia I guess it takes to kind of move everything that slight adjustment it's it could be scary because it's unknown and people will stay in the kind of habit or rut or groove that they're in just because that's comfortable and so um i think i would encourage people to take a look at that uh in their life and then i will say there was a point like right after where i was like oh my gosh what did i do and then there was a point where you know financially i had to kind of get ready for a dip which i was prepared for and then in that dip there were scary moments of is this actually going to go like is this going to get that first toehold of traction and i saw this graph oh. online and it said you know it's a it's a it's a flat line for a long long time and it's like when you think nothing's working and then it starts to blip blip and then it goes exponentially up mm -hmm. and they're like don't give up right before your first blip right before your first like oh i can see that now so that really encouraged me that just that visual of oh yeah it looks like nothing's happening but it's building it's building and then it pops and so i think that's another important aspect for people to keep in mind I was just on a coaching call. I, I have uh, that's actually a group coaching thing that I'm that I'm taking part of, and uh, the coaches there were were making a great point along these lines where it really is about sort of our our frequency, our vibrational frequency. Where and a lot of that times where you really can't see it, but you're working on your beliefs, you're working on yeah. those things that that empower you. Maybe getting rid of those things that are holding you back, and as you do that work, 
it takes a little bit of time, but that's when you start getting, like you just described that toehold and then boom, things happen before you knew it. it. And it looks to everybody else like it's overnight, but it really is a longer yes. process than that. Yes. There's no such thing as an overnight success. Like everyone no. who's been called an overnight success spent years and years and years putting in the work, putting in the reps. So um, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And I think there's like, um, there is this great like analogy or poem. I think it was by not the Dalai Lama, but uh, uh, someone who wrote, wrote a book about the Tao Te Ching or something like okay. that. And they said, it's like striking a rock over and over and over again. And you think nothing's that. happening. And then all of a sudden, on like the a thousandth strike, the rock crumbles because you've yes. been putting little cracks and splinters into it the whole time. Yep. There you go. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, let me steer us a little bit into the eye of power world because I'm uh, perhaps selfishly, but I really do want to learn from you as it relates to uh, how you might use a model like the eye of power from the perspective of a chief of staff, because I haven't done that yet. So I, I, you, you're probably going to be able to give me some insights and hopefully other people can learn from those insights. So uh, the thing about the eye of power that I think distinguishes it is it's a it's a flashlight it's a model there's lots of models out there to help us understand ourselves better there's there's you know no shortage of those and they all help us right because they you can use these things to get insights that you might not otherwise see that same way uh but what i'm trying to do with with the eye of power is yes shine the flashlight but but actually help people step along the journey because it's not just an intellectual exercise. The insight's only a small piece of the pie. Uh, changing behavior is a complicated pro uh, a proposition because we are not just intellectual, logical creatures, right? We are, oh, yeah. we are creatures of emotion. And for that reason, making positive changes is not just finding something out and doing it. Everybody knows this. We're in, early in the year here. People are in mid uh, New Year's resolution and some have already <laughs> fallen off the the path and we're only a few weeks in and that's because it's emotion and we are complicated creatures and we we think we know ourselves but all we see is the part of the iceberg above the water and there's a whole bunch of ourselves that remain hidden and for that reason what i say is it's really not a good strategy to try to make po permanent positive changes alone it's it's way better to do it with help so uh you know, having a coach, for instance, is a really, yeah. really good idea because you can't see your own blind spots. You need so another human being to help you make critical decisions and then have that accountability piece. And then ultimately, not just an accountability, but also a um, an emotional bond that says, you know what, I I, I don't want to disappoint that person. I I, I want to I want to make that person proud. I want to make that person feel good. I want to I want to reward that person. In other words. We are in a collective uh, project together and we, we humans need each other and that's where we get purpose from. So what I've got with this system is when you, when you install it, people are trained as guides, they go and then you, they're, you're assigned as a guide. So you're, so you're assigned a guide and then shortly thereafter, you are guiding somebody else. So you're going through a program that has it corresponds to the various sectors of the model, um, and and each sector is is archetypical, but it may or may not be the thing that you're wrestling with at the moment. So they'll it'll be different things for different people. So for that reason, it's gonna it's gonna have a a, a customizable sort of an element to it because what you want to work on and why it's an important thing for you to work on will be different than the person sitting next to you or in a different role in the organization. So what the, the effort here is to get something that is going to tap, to tap into all of what I just laid out there to help people have the highest chances of making that positive change they know intellectually what they want to make. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a chief of staff, if you are wanting to install something like this, what are your things that you'd would come to mind to you, Emily, that you would think about in terms of uh, either either things that you think might be challenges or things that you would want to take advantage of or, you know, w wide open question there for you? Yeah. So let me throw out a few thoughts and then I'll, I might ask you a few more questions on kind of how you're doing it today. Just for reference, I would say some of the things that came up where you were talking 
was there's always a change management piece to chief of staffing. Sometimes that's minimal. It's kind of you're in a mature company and it's it's pretty stable, but you're always kind of fine tuning, tweaking things, adjusting to the industry. And sometimes it's sweeping, like like ground shaking changes for the organization. And so a chief of staff is literally leading people through uh, a process of change management where like there's all the stages where it's like, okay, we need to acknowledge and accept this is happening we need to mourn the loss so to speak and then we need to be open to this new opportunity and what's what's ahead and then we need to embrace it and figure out what are the what are the positive pieces um, to look forward to and so i think there's kind of the overall change management process which like i mentioned before is across the different functional areas there's also the human element which i think you were talking about too where a lot of chiefs of staff are are coaches, like maybe not officially, but they're coaching in in that capacity where they're helping their executive um, CEO and their executive team manage themselves through this change so they can then manage their team. And a big part of uh, being chief of staff is is keeping the CEO sane, is keeping everyone in a good headspace so they're not cluttered and they're not stressed and not carrying that to their team. So those were just some of the things that initially came up as you were talking, but, you know, would be interested to hear kind of how you're deploying this and installing this today and then maybe uh, mapping that to what a chief of staff would be doing or, you know, augmenting, okay, well, if a chief was, if a chief of staff was involved, here's how that could go. The the idea is born at the individual level because that's where the work is, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's the person looking in the sitting in the seat, looking in the mirror, having enough courage and honesty to see it and say, okay, this is real, and this is these are this is what's true. This is what's this is why I'm this way. This is why I'm frustrated here. This is why I have this dream. This is what, you know, sorting out those things that make us want to move from status point A to status point B. Yeah. The, and that, and it is an individual sport in that way. And then what I was saying earlier is, yes, that's true. But to go, for, to plan to go from A to B by yourself is probably not going to take the least amount of time. And it'll probably cost you more in pain and suffering than if you would perhaps team up with somebody that has your best interests at heart and then ideally would be trustworthy enough to have skill at you know getting you and and seeing okay here this step is going to mean this so let's not go there um so it is a collective enterprise in that way and and that 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 coaching skill you were just pointing to is something that i think is any organization i'm going to ask you this pointed question emily um my the the thing i'm thinking about is wouldn't every organization be the culture be better off if we could elevate the coaching skill of all of the managers and all the people in the in the in the organization would you what, of course would... yeah of course um and i i would think i'm not saying that just because i'm a coach i i do right. feel that way i think that um you know we lead ourselves before we lead anyone else. We're, we're the CEO of our own lives before we're the CEO of a company. And yep. so um, I, another quote from a philosopher who's a lot smarter than me was, you know, you can control other people and that's, and that's, you know, powerful in its own way. But if you have control and awareness of yourself, that's true wisdom. And so I think we, if, if we're trying to optimize ourselves as people, as humans, as leaders, our results and our output and our interaction with people is a natural extension of that work. Mm. So it's, it's, it's like, you just exude, you just exude um, different things when you're working on yourself, when you're clear about your goals, when you're clear about what you're good at and what your development areas are. Um, I think, I think that's key. I mean, I think it unlocks so much. And I think we've all had points where we're, going in circles and we're trying to like logic this thing out and we can't see a way out of it. And then someone looking from the outside will say, oh, well, what about this? And you're like, oh my gosh, like I didn't even see that, but that's a great point because that changes this whole dynamic, this whole this whole equation here. So let me look at this thing a new way. So I think just things like that 
uh, are super helpful. I think having someone who's for you. So a lot of people, you know, they go out and they're competing and they're trying not to do anything wrong and they're all these different social situations and having a space with another person where, oh, I can let my guard down a little bit. I can trust this person because this person is 100% for me. They want me to be successful. They want me to reach my goals. And that doesn't mean they're going to be, you know, that doesn't mean they're not going to challenge me in certain places, but it means their job is to get me to my top performance. And I know that. So anything that I'm hearing from them, anything that they're saying to me is in that, in that effort. So the things that swim against that in organizations come out of our, our weaknesses, right? Our, our, we feel vulnerable. We feel like less than, or we feel that we're, you know, the idea to me is is we have these insecurities and so people will maybe fulfill personas perhaps they'll they'll yeah. they'll put out an image of strength that they don't actually believe that's them and it isn't really them uh deep down and they don't realize that if they would put the persona down and just lean into what they are develop those things it'd be a lot less work and but 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 it's it's that effort to prop up that image that keeps people from away from that honest cur courage that allows them to develop. Um, and that leads to the political animal in organizations, right? Where I got to be invested in what everybody else thinks rather than what is. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I was involved with the DISC profile and DISC assessments uh -huh. for a while. And right. there's this thing called your natural style and your adapted style. And so, right. you know, you're nodding, so you probably know what it is, but natural style is like how you show up when you're watching Netflix on the couch. And yep. adapted style is how you show up when you're in a meeting with your leadership team. And for most people, there's a little bit of a difference. Like some people are like, nope, I'm me wherever I go, take That's it or right. leave it. But most people adjust a little bit. And it's taking a look at that and saying, am I stretching way, way, way out, outside of my natural style? And if you are, is that worth it? So in some situations, like you have to take yourself out of your normal comfort zone just to be able to operate in a certain scenario, um, like something drastic, like, oh my gosh, someone's in a burning building. Well, I don't feel like running in the burning building, but here, here's what needs to happen in this situation. But in the, in the team meeting situation, do I need to be that far outside of my natural style? Or do I think I need to do that to impress all of these people? Or do I think I have to show up in this persona to be successful in this company? So it's just worth taking a look at maybe the answer is yes. And you're like, okay, in this, in this thing I'm in now, I have to be this way, but usually you can make some adjustments and, and the gap between your natural style and your adapted style takes energy. That's right. So that's what you were saying before. It takes so much energy to prop that thing up. And again, if you have to do that to survive or be successful in certain situations, then, then just know that and recharge your battery someplace else. But take a look at that and see, oh, can I just be closer to the real me and have that have that be accepted uh, with my with my team? Yeah, that's I think you hit it the nail on the head with it, it takes energy and then you, that energy takes you, you don't know. So you don't know that you don't see the energy it takes and then you wonder why you're tired, burnt out, stressed. <laughs> you know, you don't know where it's coming from. And so it, it, it creates a thing that sneaks up on you. The benefit of it, I suppose, when I'm debriefing that uh, on a disc, I'll, what I'll say is um, you might be able to naturally or, or you might be able to connect with rapport with a wider range of people because you are adept at sort of adapting in the moment. And that is a benefit. Uh but at what cost? So I, I, I think, I think no matter what your profile is or your personality or skills or, you know, level of experience or whatever, it seems to me that what you really want to do is get real as much as you can with yourself and be real as much as you can with other people. Cause that's where all the power is. Yeah. As so, well, soon as you get, as soon as you drift away from reality, you're losing power. Yeah, no, I think that's good. So a few, a few things there when you let what someone else thinks about you dictate your day and they're pulling pulling you around by a chain right you're giving away your power yes. you're, you're literally saying 
you, someone outside of myself, you tell me how I can feel. You tell me if I can feel okay in this situation or if I need to be nervous. You tell me if I'm, I'm worthy to be on the team or if I'm not worthy to do any of this. Yep. The other piece that the, a distinction I would make is for DISC, one of the great things about DISC is it'll help you communicate more effectively with people who have another style. So for instance, like some people like short and sweet bullet points, get straight to the point. Other people like slow and methodical and take me through the spreadsheet and take me through the cells and the spreadsheet and all, all of that stuff. So it helps you communicate and, and adjusting your communication style and flexing that to your audience is very effective and something you probably should put energy to. Being someone you're not is, is negative energy, right? So you're, you're propping yourself up and that's some place where you can conserve your energy and be a little bit closer to your authentic self. And one thing I'd say there, um people can tell when you're being yourself people can even they might they might not even notice consciously or be able to describe it but something subconsciously they can they can pick on pick up on where oh this person is just really comfortable and really secure and grounded in who they are versus like this person is like flitting all around and trying to do all these different things and put on a song and dance and people can pick up on that so i think that's something to to consider too that's that energy, that the that 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 frequency we're talking about with the, when, when we were talking about going along, going along, going along, and then boom, boom, boom. It's when things get congruent in the way you're describing there that that corresponds with that takeoff um, where you see, where your power starts manifesting and you start making a difference in in, in the lives of other people. Yeah. That um, it's funny. I was smiling earlier when you're talking, to Emily, about the 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 practicing of of of, of the disc. I started a company years ago called the communication gym, which one of the things we did is we practiced those uh, adjustments. And I think there's utility there. I, I, I was with that company uh, for most well, seven, eight years. And, um, and I think there's good utility there to notice, okay, this person is like you were saying, they, they want the bullet points, just give them the, give them the top three things and be on with it. And there's nothing inauthentic about noticing that and adapting to that, right? It, it, w if, if I'm the kind of person that wants every single thing spelled out before I'm going to make a decision, it doesn't mean that everybody else thinks that same way, right? So if I if I just take what's in my head and assume it's what's in everybody yeah. else's head, I'm not Thank going to be you. as effective, right? <laughs> as, as if I can say, okay, look, this is how I think, but I understand that other, other people think something else. So this is a skill. It doesn't necessarily mean in authenticity. It just means it's a skill, and and I'm and like you said, able to to serve a wider range of people in a more elegant way. It just makes you more effective. It just makes yeah. you better at your job. So you're not trying to be something you're not. You're just understanding the different people in the world. So, but people um, can get hung up on it though. They think, well, you know, I this is the way I talk. I I am soft and I am slow. <laughs> Well, let me, let me, I mean, for, for a soft talker, if your kid was about to get run over by a car, would you get loud? <laughs> but I think you exactly. can do different things. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, so, so, but one of the things I, I, I think there's a lot of utility in, in what we're talking about, and I think people should pay attention to this and, and, um, but I'll tell you what moved me away from the, the, the training of the techniques and the hows of, uh, of the world, because there's tons of them and yeah. we can learn these sorts of things. Uh, I, I, my experience in, in training people like that was I sort of fell out of love with the how and more in love with the why, because I would, we would have clients that would come in, they would, they would do it, they'd have success, and then we'd never see them again. And, and, and I'd be like, why did that happen? And, and it's all, and I learned that it's really not so much the how it's much more the why it's it, like, we have to get attached to purpose and get to see, look, here is the special thing that I, that, that I've been given in life. This is my set of gifts, my set of things that I'm into. It's not accidental. It's like, this is the package, right? And the best advice that I can think of that I've ever gotten and I give to people is let's look at those, let's develop them, let's, let's feed them, nourish them, and then figure out, okay, what's the best way I can put this to service with other people? That's going to throw fuel on the fire, right? To our sense of meaning and purpose, which gives us energy, which gives us more potency, which increases our power and our ability to help people. And you create this positive spiral, right? And, and, and so 
So to me, it's it's connecting to that why, and it, it really is digging to what's real and true for people that that it seems to me fundamental. What's your view on all of that? I agree that the how is is the tactical kind of surface level stuff, and you have yeah. to have that at a certain point. Sure. But the why is the intrinsic, instinctive kind of gut level stuff, and it can inspire you and push you and pull you through tough times and when you have a strong connection and clarity to why you're doing something and making sure that's aligned to your purpose which is something we talked about at the top of the conversation i think that's that's the key current if you're just dealing with the how and tactics you're you're missing like the big the big foundational piece yeah. now, to be most effective you should have both so you sure. should understand why you're doing something and then have these tools on how to get there and how to flex into different leadership situations. But I think the most important question is why? And so for anyone listening to this, you could ask yourself right now, why'd you get up today? What got you up in the morning? Why do you do what you do? And you could ask yourself a series of why questions. Well, most people will say, well, well, I got up and I kind of took a shower and I had breakfast and uh, I took the kids to school and then I, I went to work and I came home and da, da, da. Okay, well, why did you do that? Well, I want to provide for my family. Okay, well, why did you do that? Well, because that's what you're supposed to do. Well, why? Well, because that's the value I hold to take care of people. I kind of peel back the onion and get, and get to your ultimate why. And I think that's just a really good exercise for people to go to, whether it's to kind of reinforce what they're doing and why they're doing it, or if it's, mm, I need to make that slight adjustment over here to be more in line with, with my big why. I love that. That's a, a, and a, another thing I'm smiling about is because again, can't see, but part of the, the model is the, 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 the sort of the iris of the eye there is, is the four quests is what I call it. And how to do it is one of the quests on the in the pain quadrant, and why to do it is the quest in the purpose quadrant. So, you're 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 speaking my language, Emily. So <laughs> I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Move it. Move into the purpose quadrant. Yes, we all should. We all should be swimming there. Well, these and you you made the point that 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 is reflected in my model there, which is and again, the model is just describing what I what I notice in in the world. Uh, not the only way to look at it. But um, these things are connected. So like you were just saying, it's it's not like, oh, I can just figure out the, the why and I can just ignore the how. No, these things build on each other, just like just like everything, right? We To gain a skill, okay, you gain a skill. You get to a certain, okay, now I'm good at this. Well, you're good, but are you great? Uh, you know, you're, you're good, you're good, are, but am I good enough that people will pay me money for that? Well, maybe I got a little bit more to go. Okay, now, now I'm good enough where people will pay me money for that. Am I noteworthy enough to sell at this level? Uh, not yet. Okay. Well, now I got to get a little bit better. So it's and and why would that be important? Well, it's important because I make a bigger difference for a wider range of people. Or there's lots of people that need and want this. So you know, I'm failing them if I don't, you know, at least give them the chance to benefit from that. So you know, there's these beliefs and these things that can drive us forward. I think there's also element of you can go through the motions and just kind of like check the box and do the things because I'm supposed to do it, or you can really be present and engage with what mm. you're doing. Mm. So for instance, you might do the exact same series. Like you might get up and have breakfast and get a shower and take the kids and go to work and all those things. You could do check the box version of that for decades and decades, or you could say, no, like I am going to spend my morning time intentionally with my family at breakfast. I'm gonna talk to them on the car ride to school. I'm gonna really engage with my coworkers and be connected to the mission of our organization for whatever period of time I'm there. And then I'm gonna come home and do these things. And you can be more connected throughout your whole day, even if like the why and the how and the what you're doing are all the same. I love that. It, and the, it, I mean, to me, that's one of the most important things for people to internalize. Um, I'll share just a quick story in my own life The um, I was on a coaching call again, being coached. This was just a few weeks ago. No, it was only two weeks, two and a half weeks ago. And I was on a, a, a coaching call and the coach was talking about some stuff about discipline. And I was like, okay, this is my discipline year. And I realized, okay, how do I lose discipline? Well, I, on my phone, I had these, you know, the Sudoku and those kind of games <laughs> that keep my mind, you know, occupied when I'm, you know, have those gaps in the, in my schedule or whatever. And 
I didn't, I, I didn't realize I, I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do away with the games. Cause I, I, I did them enough to know that it was taking away my bandwidth, but not, but, but I didn't know to what degree. And so at that moment in time, I said, no games. And I, I wrote, I'm looking at my board in my office here. There's, I wrote, this is the year of discipline. No games is one of it. So I erased all the games off my phone. My fingers are shaking, Emily, as I'm erasing them. That's how important <laughs> they were. So, like, I didn't know that they were that important to me. So, so, uh, so I, 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 I deleted them all. Well, in that time, I'm shocked at how much more present I am with my loved ones, how much more frosty I am with ideas that come. I had no idea the price I was paying. If I knew, if I had any idea that those little distractions were costing me what I, what, what I did, I would never, ever have started in on any of them. Yeah. So, so it's Powerful. like, so, and at times how many things, right? It can be video games. It can be whatever the distractions are, television, I mean, it can be things that are harmless, right? I mean, crocheting, it doesn't have to be this bad thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong inherently with these things, but when they take us out of that present moment that you just pointed at, they're robbing us of our own life. They are. I mean, if, I mean, if you look at the stats, like, like I, this is going to make me sound old, but young people today are spending <laughs> their entire life on, like, da -da -da -da, on this little magic rectangle in their hand. And I mean, years, if you add all that time up, they're probably taking years off their life doing that stuff. And I mean, we've all seen the studies where, you know, the social media platforms and those games, they know how the brain works and they build their apps to be addictive. And so they, you're they literally- They don't play fair. They yeah, do not you're literally, play fair. You're working against, you're working against some smart people. They're not necessarily good people all the time, but smart people who know how to get your brain going on the dopamine. Yeah. Hits. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure they're doing anything that they think is nefarious necessarily. They want you to be on the game and they want the game to be as engaging they want it as to be possible. profitable. Yeah. They want you to be as, as enjoying it. They want my game to be better than the next guy's game that, you know, and none of these things by themselves are what I'd call bad or evil, yeah. but what they don't do is they don't, they don't relieve us of our individual responsibility to be the captain of our ship, the author of our story. And so when, we, and you know, I'm 62 years old, I'm, I'm just learning this lesson right now. <laughs> so, you know, what I would say to that is, so I play words with friends and I, okay. I just play that. I love that game. That's a great I, I love, game. I love that game. It's kind of interacting with, with my different friends. So it's fun that way, but I'm in control of that. So if you ever get to a point where it's in control of you versus you being in control of when you do that and how you do that and how much time, then I think that's a good dynamic to look at. People know when it's controlling them and people know when when they're when they're on top of things. And so I think for me, being deliberate with your time and being deliberate in your day. So that's kind of a New Year's resolution or kind of a, a reinforcing theme that I had for this year. It's I, I really want to be deliberate and focused with my time. Beautiful. And so you can look at the things that zoop, take your focus over like squirrel, shiny yeah. app, yep. whatever, like ding, 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 ding. Okay. So take a look at all those things and start to start to clear the decks for your big purpose, why, and your big uh, priorities. And I think, I think just that type of exercise is helpful. And if you're saying, Hey, Emily, you know, I am deliberate with my priorities and playing games on my phone is part of that okay that's that's works for you so whatever works for you but i would go through that kind of process and take some inventory of what's moving me closer to my goals and who i want to be and what's taking me further away do i want to be someone who plays games eight hours a day is that is that who i want to be or do i want to be someone who you know relaxes and has some fun and sometimes that includes games every once in a while but i'm more so dedicated to this area over here yeah I, and i totally understand that too i mean we, we we do need downtime we do need to relax we do need to find our ways to just sort of chill uh, and, and, but having said that I, I, there's an insidious element to these things so having gone through what i just went through what i would emphasize to people is even if you think it's not a problem for you just take it just just, you know, go on a diet on it. Just for, just try, like, you know, just say, okay, you know what? I'm going to put that away for a week and then I'll come back next week and just see if you notice anything. Yeah. You might notice, number one, that it's hard to do for a yeah. week and that tells you something. Yeah. Um, but you might notice some things that you thought, like for me at least, I thought I was present. I, I thought that I was... Um, you know, engaged with my family. And this was over the a holiday where my daughter was in town and... Um, 
the fact I'll get, I'll give you an example. The, the fact that, um, I wasn't on that game, those games, which normally I'd be sitting there. I'd be like, I'd watch a football game. I'd be doing this. I'd be in hog heaven, just like, you know, getting my dopamine fixes and, and just, you know, just happy. Um, they wanted to go out to the greenhouse uh, and that's something they do regularly on, uh, you know, over the holidays, it's something they'd done a number of years. And, and uh, because I wasn't playing that game, I'm like, well, I, I could go. Why, why can't I go? Mm. So, so I just went with them and we had a lovely time. And I, that's a time that, that I would not have had with my wife and daughter that I did get to have. And now I could think, yeah. well, how many times in the past did I not have that? I could yeah. cry over the spilled milk and that's neither here nor there. Um, but going forward, I'm like, you know, it just shows me in fairly clear terms what's, port what's more important than what and how easy it is. Because no, I don't think anybody's going to sit there and say, no, I'd rather sit there and play whatever that thing is then then go have a time with somebody you don't get to see that much yeah no, that's a great story and i think there, there's got to be so many cases of that all over the place so it's something to look at i mean look everything in life is a trade-off so you're making intentional decisions and you're trading it off and and sometimes that's tough because you're like i really want to do both of these things like spend time with my daughter and go do this you know um you know kind of volunteer activity and both of those are good and and you have to choose but there's trade-offs to everything so just make sure you're making a deliberate choice that's a great piece of wisdom i think that's a good thing to for us to start to wrap up on is there anything else a lot either we touched on that's still on your mind or anything else you might want to add emily no i mean we covered a lot of ground i think <laughs> you know d doing the work on yourself and and don't overwhelm yourself with it you know just do the little things you can here and there and let me tell you those little things those small wins will add up faster than you think so keep doing them every day and you will you will start becoming the person that you're creating and a lot of people are are like i need these other things to define me and it's like your choices your deliberate choices and how you spend your time and energy define who you are and so you can literally by your actions create your character which i think is very freeing first of all because you're in control of that and it it opens up the possibility so it's like oh okay well i guess if i do this like 10 minutes a day i'm a kind of person who does that yeah you are that's how that works so i would i would look at yourself and be self-aware and then also have fun and be free in creating the person you want to be through your actions I love that. That's a, I call that the power of incrementalism where we, we, in our, in our society, we're so successful with all these amazing technological breakthroughs and we have pharmaceutical breakthroughs and we think that there's quick answers for every problem. And uh, when it comes to developing ourselves and being the full, full person that we're meant to be, that's not a quick fix shortcut kind of proposition. That's a, that's a do the incremental thing on a daily basis and watch it happen. And again, it goes back. I think the theme of our discussion, it goes, at least in my mind, goes to what you were talking about with the, you know, it doesn't seem like anything's happened, then blip, 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 and then whoom. And I think that's a lot of what happens in, in life where you just keep on keeping on. The things you know are moving you in the right direction. And then sooner or later, at some point, you start to see it. And then you're just astounded how, how that exponential um payoff comes yeah absolutely awesome well thank you so much emily i very much appreciate your time i loved our conversation today yeah me as well thank you so much tom i thank you for what you're doing and everything you're putting out there and it was a pleasure pleasure being on your show and hopefully we can continue our conversations i'd love that thank you so much emily for being on the show today uh what i take away is quite a bit there i really like how you laid out the chief of staff position as a person who uh, connects dots among different groups of uh, business function, uh, somebody who has a really good view of organizational architecture and is a position to see it in a strategic manner. Uh, you point, uh, underline the care and feeding of the CEO and the other C-level people's you know, sanity. I like that aspect of it. The ability that they'll have to be adaptable and fill gaps. And I thought that might help as uh, organizations go through stages of growth. 
um, or they might be in different states. They might be in in a, a place of a turnaround. They might have to, you know, they might have different places where they have to focus and having somebody who's adaptable like that and can fill in rather than have to hire every single function. Uh, I think that's a, that's a potential benefit there of that role. We talked a little bit about how uh, that relates to change management. Sometimes change management management is subtle. Sometimes it's sweeping, she said. Uh, she, we focused a lot on the human element of things and how we can give away our power, uh, how it's important to be present and engaged. And she highlighted the, the power of the incremental, which we talk a lot about in the eye of power, don't we? So uh, I thought it was a great show. And again, thank you, Emily, for being my guest today. This has been the Eye of Power podcast with Tom Dardick. I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd also like to thank my brother, Scott Dardick, for the music and his music production. If you'd like to reach me, simply email tom at dardickcommunications.com.